Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege we have to come together and to consider how your word has shaped our heritage and those that have gone before us. We want to be good stewards of that which has been entrusted to us. And so help us to think about this important matter of confessionalism and how we ought to think about our own lives before you and in this world and how we ought to think about our churches. So we're asking for your help in these ways. In Jesus' name, amen. A crisis in Baptist doctrine is evidently approaching, and those of us who still cling to the doctrines which were formerly distinguished had distinguished us have the important duty to perform of earnestly contending for the faith once delivered to the saints. Gentlemen, God will call us to judgment if we neglect it. The evil is one which calls for the adoption of a remedy by every church and every minister among us. It demands that every doctrine of Scripture be determined and expressed and that all should see to it. The churches which call and the presbyteries which ordain that that those set apart to preach the word be men, quote, whose faith of the, the churches may follow and who take heed to themselves and to the doctrine and are not as many who corrupt the word of God, close quote. So said James Pettigrew Boyce in 1856 as he was making an argument for the establishment of a Baptist seminary in the South. He was concerned with what he saw going on in churches and among Baptists, not just in the South, but also in the North, and particularly recognized the need for a school that would teach in accordance with, not contrary to, recognized, understood doctrines. Now, Boyce himself had received theological training at Old Princeton, and he was simply articulating for his fellow Baptists that which had, he had learned at Princeton, that which is both inherent and self-evident in biblical Christianity, namely that truth is foundational to the faith. If what one believes is not true, then the faith which one professes is not genuine saving faith. True doctrine doctrine is always foundational to true faithful devotion. Our agenda, what we do, is always informed by our credenda, uh, that which we believe. The relationship between doctrine and devotion or truth in life is seen throughout the scriptures. The Lord Jesus stated quite simply that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's no freedom apart from truth. And to embrace the truth properly results in life-giving freedom. This is why our Lord prayed in his high priestly prayer in John 17 that God would sanctify his disciples by the truth. And then said, your word is truth. The apostles continued emphasizing this relationship between truth and life in their New Testament ministries and letters. Paul admonishes young Timothy, quote, keep a close watch on yourself and the teaching or the doctrine. He instructs Titus to appoint elders in the churches on the island of Crete. And each one of those elders must be men who are qualified in meeting certain standards of character and conduct, including being solidly grounded in revealed truth. In Titus 1.9, Paul says, Such a man who would be an elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict. The importance of truth and its relationship to healthy Christianity is seen in the structure of many New Testament letters and of sections in various letters. Often the apostles will start with doctrinal assertions, doctrinal instructions, followed by practical and ethical admonitions, indicatives, that which is, that which is to be believed, then become the foundation for the imperatives, the commands the instructions regarding how we are to live. We see this very clearly in Paul's letter to the Ephesians and his letter to the Romans. If you read the letter to Ephesians, you'll see 
that in the first three chapters, he is laying out doctrine after doctrine after doctrine, including the doctrines of election and union with Christ and predestination and depravity and the new birth. And then when he gets to chapter 4, he begins to make practical application. And he starts that chapter with these words, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Here's the truth. Here are the things I want you to believe, the things that we must know. And on the basis of that, live this way. He does the same thing in the book of Romans. The first 11 chapters, some of the most wonderful, careful teaching that we have in all the New Testament regarding doctrine that is to be believed, including the doctrine of the universality of sin and the blessedness of justification by God's grace through faith. Again, union with Christ and the place of the law and the ministry of the Spirit And the sovereignty of God over time, throughout history and into the future, that sovereignty that does indeed help us to look and to appreciate the fact that God chose us in Christ and that we are his people from all of eternity. And then coming to chapter 12, he begins to drive it home practically. And he starts chapter 12 this way. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Christianity is more than a way of life. It is a way of life, but it is a way of life that is grounded in a body of truth. It arises from truth. It's not simply a list of of morals or things that we are to do. Rather, Our faith rests on truth, the truth that God has revealed to us in Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is and what God has done to reconcile sinners like us to himself. Only by receiving this truth, trusting who Christ really is, it's only through this that a person can be made right with God, that he can become a Christian. That's why we see the scripture so repeatedly commending the importance of truth and warning us against any distortions of truth. So Proverbs 23, 23 tells us to buy the truth and never sell it, never sell it. It's why Isaiah laments truth falling, stumbling in the streets, in the public square. It's why the Apostle Paul speaks so graphically and strongly as he does in Galatians 1 regarding those who would distort the gospel. Listen again to what he says. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed, anathema, condemned to hell. He repeats it. As we have said before, So now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Truth matters. Doctrine matters. Theology matters. As David Wells has noted, from the time of the Protestant Reformation on, the work of theology has consisted of three essential ingredients. And the first is confession. And the second is reflection on that which we confess. And the third is the cultivation of virtues based on confession and reflection. It's that first element, confession, that we have in mind tonight and that we want to think more deeply about in our time together. Confessionalism. Now, let me give you my definition of what I mean by confessionalism. I mean a commitment to defining, adhering to, and defending clearly stated truths that are sincerely believed. A commitment to defining, adhering to, and defending clearly stated truths that are sincerely believed. While there is a certain sense in which all Christianity is necessarily confessional in a de facto sort of way, 
What I am arguing for is a sturdy kind of confessionalism, one that conscientiously and unashamedly and very carefully declares what is believed and what is to be taught. And I want to make three points about this and drawing out some practical advantages of what I'm calling robust confessionalism. The first is this. Christianity is inherently confessional. To be a Christian is to confess. Every Christian, every church has a creed or a confession. Credo simply means I believe. Christians are believers. Hence, all Christians have a creed or a confession. Now, granted, not all Christians, not all churches have a well-thought-out creed or confession. They might not have one that is written. I want to argue they should have. Our faith is inherently creedal. If it is inevitable and necessary that you have a creed or a confession in order to be Christian, well, then it would stand to reason that you ought to try to be as careful as you can be to state exactly what it is that you believe and to declare that openly. The Bible demonstrates the inherent confessionalism of the Christian religion. We see it uh, throughout Old and New Testaments in Deuteronomy 6, the Shema, whenever all Israel was called upon to remember and recite, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The two fundamental truths of the Israelite religion is embraced in that. God exists, and that God is the one true God. We see it in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, where Paul says, Follow the pattern of the sound words that I have, you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Pattern of sound words, as Dr. Renahan mentioned. This is not simply talking about words that you would memorize. This is talking about a body of divinity, uh, that which has meaning and consists of something that can be regarded as healthy. In other words, something like a creed or something like a confession. The good deposit that Paul refers to, it's a valuable message that Timothy had received from Paul. Again, something that would be understood from Paul to Timothy, that when he uses this language would come to Timothy's mind, something like a confession, a creed. Jude 3 tells us to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith is a body of truth, a body of divinity. As Christians, we don't just have like a, a box of individual doctrines. We have a body of truth that has been revealed to us that fits together. And the more we think about that carefully, the more we articulate that, the more we are moving down this road of confessionalism. Well, there are obviously sections of the apostolic letters that the authors of those letters intended for the recipients to keep in mind as a summary of these important truths to be taught. Five times, Paul uses this phrase, the, this saying is trustworthy, to highlight such teachings. And you can go and look at those places in the pastoral epistles, and you can see that what Paul has in mind is something that can be grasped, something that can be articulated. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7, 8, and 9, he writes, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. This is something, Timothy, I want you to think about and remember, hold together, and commend as being worthy of everyone's acceptance. It's trustworthy. Well, given the apostolic emphasis on the importance of conceiving considering our faith, conceiving our faith in these terms, it's not surprising to see creedal and confessional statements being developed and utilized from the earliest centuries of the church. 
In the early, early 20th century, a Baptist leader in the South, E.Y. Mullins, noted that the best of our creeds and confessions have arisen out of this deep, deep religious affections. He writes, The great creeds which have powerfully influenced the life of mankind have all arisen in periods of great religious energy and deep religious experience. They are like lava which comes hot from the volcano, and inner power expels them. Just think about the creeds that we have had handed down to us. The Apostles' Creed that took its final form in the 8th century, but appears to be based upon an old Roman creed from the 2nd century. It's a summary of what all Christians everywhere have always believed. The Nicene Creed from the 4th century, which is an elaboration of those basic beliefs and has a greater emphasis upon the Trinitarian nature of our God. The Reformation era saw an explosion of confessions and catechisms to further express in summary fashion the things that were to be believed, the things that distinguish Protestants from Catholics and Protestants from Protestants. So we have Luther's large and small catechism, the Augsburg Confession of 1530, the Belgic Confession of 1561, the Heidelberg Catechism. 1563, in the post-Reformation era, this continued on. The Canons of Dort, 1619, the First London Baptist Confession of 1644 and 46, the Westminster Confession of 1646, and the Catechisms that came after it in 1649, the Savoy Declaration in 1658, the Second London Baptist Confession, 1677 or 1689 as it's more commonly known. These and literally dozens of other recognized confessions have been formulated by God's people throughout history to serve churches and associations by declaring simply, clearly, what they understand the Bible to teach. By formally articulating their doctrinal convictions, making them available for examination, those who framed these confessions, who adopted these confessions and promoted them, were able to identify themselves rather than passively sitting back and letting others identify them. They were also able to distinguish themselves and their beliefs from others. I appreciate what the English Baptist leader Andrew Fuller says about this. He wrote, The man who has no creed has no belief, which is the same thing as being an unbeliever. And he whose belief is not formed into a system has only a few loose, unconnected thoughts without entering into the harmony and glory of the gospel. Every well-informed and consistent believer, therefore, must have a creed, a system which he supposes to contain the leading principles of divine revelation. By being intentionally confessional, Christians and churches make the implicit explicit. They're saying, this we believe. They take what they inherently and inevitably believe as Christians and articulate it as carefully as they can so that their beliefs can be understood and considered and evaluated. So Christianity is inherently confessional. But secondly, confessionalism provides for healthy Christianity. It provides for healthy Christianity. Again, let me remind you of my definition. Confessionalism is a commitment to defining, adhering to, and defending clearly stated truths that are sincerely believed. While being confessional is no guarantee against being aberrant in your Christianity, confessionalism is a great aid to spiritual health. And disregard for confessional fidelity always works against spiritual health. Well, that being the case, why isn't every Christian church confessional? Why is there so much hesitation about it? Dr. Renahan talked about some of the things that have been said. And there have been arguments and concerns raised about confessionalism uh, for centuries. Um, One of them that's heard often is that confessions and creeds are coercive. They bind the conscience sinfully 
and they stifle study. They stifle free inquiry. I think this owes a lot to the, the memory of Galileo, who was coerced to deny what he knew to be true, what he'd come to believe to be true about the earth revolving around the sun, and he had to renounce that as heresy under the threat of the sword. And that kind of coercion and that kind of confession that was coerced, some people automatically think, well, when you talk about creeds and confessions, that's what you're talking about. A second concern that's been raised against confessions and creeds is that they undermine Scripture's authority. Sola Scriptura, that's who we are, right? Scripture alone is our final authority. No creed but the Bible. There have been groups that have actually said that to justify their allergies against confessions. Samuel Miller summarizes the concern of those who raise this objection by writing, The Bible, say those who urge this objection, is the only infallible rule of faith and practice. It is so complete that it needs no human addition, and so easily understood that it requires no human explanation. Why then should we desire any other ecclesiastical standard? Why subscribe ourselves or call upon others to subscribe any other creed than this plain, inspired, and perfect one? Well, I want to honor what's good in that concern. There's something maybe intuitively appropriate about being concerned that anything would take the place of Scripture. Because Scripture and Scripture alone is breathed out by God. Scripture's holy and infallible and inerrant. Scripture alone is the, has the proper authority to be Lord of the conscience of every believer. And we all know the story of Martin Luther when he stood before that imperial diet at Worms in 1520. He was called upon to recant his convictions in the books that he had written. And after trembling and praying over it a night, he stands before that great inquisition and he says, unless I'm convicted by scripture in plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils because they've contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Now we ought to say amen to that. I mean, that ought to be part of every protestants dna we say yes show me from the word of god but don't forget that the man who said that went on to produce two catechisms and helped to frame the augsburg confession so so don't take luther's stand as a justification for some type of anti-confessionalism that you think would be honored by what it was he was doing confessionalism is no threat to sola scriptura. It's actually a safeguard to sola scriptura. Every good confession will have a strong statement on scripture's authority, as does the second London Baptist confession or the 1689. The very first words in that confession in chapter one says this, the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. J.L. Reynolds was a 19th century American Baptist statesman, and he wrote this, The use of a confession of faith so far from disparaging the authority of the Bible as a standard really exalts it. It insists upon a correct interpretation of the word of God, a cordial reception of its truths, and an entire submission to its directions. Some people, I think, confuse sola scriptura for solo scriptura or nuda scriptura, which is the idea of bare scripture. Me and the Bible. That's all that I need. In other words, they would think there's no other truth, there's no other source of truth besides the Bible, and therefore, if I've got the Bible, I don't need teachers, I don't need confessions, I don't need anything else to help me. 
Our affirmation of sola scriptura, however, recognizes that the Bible is the final, absolute, and highest authority by which all human opinions and practices must be evalu- evaluated. Again, listen to the Second London Baptist Confession in the 10th paragraph of chapter 1. The supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Scripture delivered by the Spirit in which, into which Scripture so delivered our faith is finally resolved. Now here's the irony. To claim no creed but the Bible is a very inadequate creed. But it is a creed. I'm not going to believe anything except the Bible. Okay, well, that's your creed. And it's a very, very weak, dangerous creed. In fact, nearly every ancient heresy has been promoted by those who affirm the Bible's authority. In that sense, they believe the Bible. They will tell you they believe the Bible. The problem is that they mistake what the Bible actually teaches. And if those mistakes are serious enough, they can lead people to hell. And so because we believe what the Bible says about the importance of truth, the importance of what God has revealed, we should be the first in trying to advocate, again, a robust confessionalism stating what we understand that word actually to teach. To embrace a healthy, thoughtful confessionalism with a confession that safeguards both the authority and the teachings of the Bible is a right approach for us today. Well, there are many benefits to confessionalism. Let me list out a few of them for you. There are benefits to individual Christians as well as to churches. A good confession enables a church to declare and defend its doctrinal commitments. By adopting a confession of faith, A church declares that it is pre-committed to certain truths. And that open, stated pre-commitment can protect a church from wolves and false teachers and aid it in controversies. Whenever outsiders want to come in and lead the church to embrace ideas that are contrary to Scripture, the confession is a useful tool to appeal to and say, this we believe. I've had that happen uh, more than a couple of times here in my own pastoral ministry. Uh, One time I'm thinking of right now, a man showed up and insisted on seeing me. And he said, the Lord has told me that I am to teach an eschatology course here. I said, well, the Lord hadn't told me that. And so uh, it's not going to happen. He said, but here's what here's what you need. Your people need this. I said, we have a confession of faith. We're on record what we believe. Also seen that happen with uh, some Seventh-day Baptists who loved the church, said they loved everything about the church, but they were absolutely convinced that the Christian Sabbath is Saturday. And they wanted to debate it. They wanted us to read all these books. And I read a couple of them and said, but look, we're committed. We're pre-committed. And one time, one of the guys, he's a good guy, nice guy. He he said, you're just not open-minded. I said, if you're expecting me to come to the table with a blank slate, it's not going to happen. I'm committed already. I'm not looking for truth in this area. I think I've found truth together with brothers and sisters for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's a helpful tool for a church to have to take advantage of. When prospective members want to join the church, our church's practice, and we're not alone in this, is to have them read our documents, including our confessions of faith, and to acknowledge that they are in substantive agreement with the confession or else to identify where they take exceptions. And there have been people who have found some exceptions and uh, then it becomes a question of, is this significant enough to say, no, you, you really aren't able to walk together with us? Or yes, that's not significant enough that we can uh, cooperate together. The hope is to keep members who come into the a confessional church from being offended by the things that they will be taught according to the confession. Because quite honestly, in a confessional church, 
It's not unusual for people who have been uh, unassociated with anything like that to hear things that they've not heard before. And they wait a minute, you know, I've been in church for 40 years. And I've never heard about unconditional election or the imputed righteousness of Christ necessary for justification. And, and so those things can be discomforting and unsettling. Well, if you state it up front, you at least then have an opportunity to have a conversation. Church officers who are called to lead out in the church need to be very familiar with the confession. In fact, we, along with other churches, have our church officers vow to uphold and defend the confession. So every time the church is installing a new elder or a new deacon, those men are called upon to stand in front of the congregation publicly and they're asked questions, including these two. Do you believe the scriptures as written in the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God? Do you accept them as the only infallible rule of faith and practice, promising to live wholly under their authority? They must answer affirmatively before the congregation. Secondly, have you personally adopted and will you cheerfully submit to and defend the confession? Our confession is the Second London Baptist, the Constitution and bylaws of this church, promising to carry out your responsibilities in accordance with these guiding documents. And they must affirm that publicly. They take vows. And because of that, the church has been in good position when it has had to, sadly, on a few occasions, remove those who had violated their vows from their offices. A good confession of faith, in addition to this, is also a wonderful tool to help teach. Listen to another quote by Charles Spurgeon. He published an edition of the Second London Baptist Confession for his con congregation in London in 1860, and he wrote a letter to all the members to commend it. And he said this in this letter, this little volume is not issued as an authoritative rule or code of faith whereby you are to be fettered, but as an assistance to you in controversy, a confirmation in faith, and a means of edification in righteousness. Here, the younger members of our church will have a body of divinity in small compass, and by means of the scriptural proofs will be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in them. Be not ashamed of your faith. Remember, it's the ancient gospel of martyrs, confessors, reformers, and saints. Above all, it is the truth of God against which the gates of hell cannot prevail. Cleave fast to the word of God, which is here mapped out for you. It's a great tool to teach, to teach theology. If you have a good confession of faith, you can just take it head by head and teach biblical theology in a systematic way. Thirdly, a good confession of faith can be used in worship. It's not uncommon in our church, and again, I know in others as well, for our pastors when they preach to quote sections of the confession to provide a succinct summary of the doctrine that is being considered from the specific text being expounded. And the ancient creeds from the church are useful tools in worship. I delight in being able to say to our congregation every Lord's Day morning, before we recite the Apostles' Creed, this is simply us standing with God's people everywhere. We believe this together with all of God's people across all time. The Nicene Creed, similarly, more expansive. We use that in our evening services as well. Well, there are other benefits to confessionalism, but let me close by simply making an appeal with my third point that the need of the day is the recovery of a robust confessionalism. We desperately need that in our circles today. Thomas Oden, the Methodist theologian, wrote in 1995 his book called Requiem, this following statement. The rediscovery of boundaries in theology will be the preoccupation of the 21st century of Christian theology. And he's been proven prophetic in that. It is needed, and in the attempts to try to address it after the need has arisen, we've seen all kinds of confusion. The challenges of the last several years have demonstrated 
our need for robust confessionalism. The so-called social justice movement duped many erstwhile respected Christian organizations and churches into promoting ungodly ideologies that are clearly outside the confessional boundaries of Protestant Reformed Baptist Christianity. Ideas like white privilege, guilt-inducing structural racism, the ideology of intersectionality that says you are defined in terms of how many privileges you accrue by virtue of your status in the world, or how many disadvantages you accrue, and the more disadvantages you have, the more oppressed you are, the more privileges or advantages you have, the more oppressive you are. I don't know if you saw it, but just uh, this last week, Johns Hopkins University made for the month of January their diversity word of the month, privilege. And then their diversity officer listed out various categories of privilege. Let me just read them to you. This is what makes you privileged and a part of the oppressive class. White people, able-bodied people, heterosexuals, cisgendered people. If you're not familiar with that, it's, you, you agree with the sex that God made you. Males, Christians, middle-class people middle-aged people, English-speaking people. I looked at that list, I thought, man, it's a good thing I'm old, you know. (laughs) That's the only disadvantage I got from Johns Hopkins. Well, those ideologies wreaked havoc upon Christian circles over the last eight to ten years or so. Had there been a robust confessionalism that was operating in a healthy way, the the fallacy of these ideologies would have been more easily recognized and resisted. For example, chapters 19 and 21 in the Second London Confession of Faith would help us. There we learn that God's laws is what defines sin, and guilt is only accrued by violating God's law, not by failing to measure up to some newly manufactured idea of virtue or righteousness. And you're not guilty of something that someone who you may or may not have been related to, but had the same kind of uh, intersectional scores that you do 300 years ago. You don't have to repent for their sins. Listen to what chapter 21 verse 2 says on the Conscience. It says, God alone is Lord of the conscience and has left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men which are in anything contrary to his word are not contained in it. Okay? So when somebody comes up and says, well, you're just a misogynist. Why? Because you don't think women should be pastors. You're wrong. I, no, I, that doesn't mean a thing to me. You're trying to accuse me of sin on the basis of something other than the word of God? Take a hike. You know, I, that doesn't mean anything. Consider the governmental overreach that we lived through in 2020 and following. That overreach that wreaked havoc on so many churches. When magistrates sought to enforce restrictions and prohibitions on worship, along with other tyrannical policies, had there been a robust confessionalism operating in churches across the board, they wouldn't have been so effective so quickly wreaking havoc in churches. For example, in chapter 24 on civil magistrates from the Second London Confession, paragraph 3, civil magistrates being set up by God for the ends aforesaid Subjection in all lawful things commanded by them ought to be yielded by us in the Lord, not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. Now, if you remember 2020, some of our erstwhile evangelical leaders said, well, the government says you can't meet Romans 13. Stay home. The government says you can't sing when you meet, so don't sing Romans 13. And they would just cite those passages as if, oh, 
That means whatever the government says or government authority says we ought to do. But did you see how careful the language of the confession is? We ought to yield to civil magistrates in all lawful things commanded by them. What does that mean? That means there's a law higher than the civil law. You mean the civil magistrate could command something that is not in keeping with law? Yes. Yes. They could command unlawful things, which happened time after time after time across our nation. Among the many churches who wrongfully fell prey to these tactics, there were indeed several who, by their own admission, are confessional. Several that I know of that have even the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. They have the confession, but I would contend they didn't use their confessions as carefully as they should have, and as a result, they weren't helped by the confessions the way that they could have been. Well, one final example comes from the Southern Baptist Convention. It's very contemporary, what's going on right now, in a struggle for the future usefulness as an association of churches. There are those in the SBC that are advocating for women pastors to be allowed to serve SBC churches. The Baptist Faith and Message, which is a very broad confession of faith recognized by the SBC, is quite clear in Article 6 when it states, while both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor, elder, overseer is limited to men as qualified by Scripture. Now, there's some that look at that and say, well, that's just talking about senior pastors. You know, of course, that's not what the word says, the language says in the confession. But because of this kind of duplicity, there has been a constitutional amendment proposed that was passed last year, must pass again this year in the upcoming annual meeting of the SBC that changes the constitution of the convention to say this, that a church must affirm, appoint, or employ, quote, only men as any kind of pastor or elder as qualified by Scripture. Again, trying to take the wiggle room out from those that are wiggling on it. So to do that, if you don't do that, you're not in friendly cooperation. Well, the passage of this amendment coming up in the summer is essential. If the SBC is going to have any hope of being turned toward greater confessional health and biblical fidelity. Furthermore, drawing those kind of boundaries for an association of churches is completely right and good and in keeping with our Baptist heritage. Listen to what Pastor S.M. Noel, who was the moderator of the Franklin Association of Baptists in Kentucky, said in the circular letter that was sent to all those churches in 1826. He writes, Creeds formed or enforced by the civil authority are usurpations, leading to persecution and to despotism while those formed voluntarily by associations of Christians enforced by no higher penalty or sanction than the exclusion from membership in the society, are not only lawful, but necessary in the present state of the religious world to deny any religious society the privilege of expressing their views of the Bible in their own words and phrases and of denying admission to those who reject their views is a violent interference with the rights of conscience. Isn't that interesting? He turns the argument on the head of those who say, well, you're just violating my conscience if you tell me that we can't participate and have our view of this. It's contrary to your confession. He says, that is tyranny. It is to subjugate the many with all their interest, right, and happiness to the dictation of one or few, the very essence of tyranny. Well, allow me to close by quoting B.H. Carroll, who was the founder of the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary that's now in Fort Worth, and let him have the last word based on commentary that he wrote on Ephesians chapter 4 on this very issue. Carroll writes, All the modern hue and cry against dogma is really against morals. There's always a moral basis to faith. The more we reduce, we reduce the number of the creed articles, the more we undermine practical religion. 
A church with a little creed is a church with a little life. The more divine doctrines that a church can agree on, the greater its power, the wider its usefulness. The fewer its articles of faith, the fewer its bonds of union and compactness. The modern cry, less creed and more liberty, is a degeneration from the vertebrate to the jellyfish. It means less unity, less morality, and it means more heresy. Definitive truth does not create heresy. It only exposes and corrects. Shut off the creed and the Christian work will fill up with heresy unsuspected and uncorrected, but nonetheless deadly. So, fellow Christians, be confessional. My fellow pastors, lead your churches to be confessional. If they're not confessional, to settle on a good confession, teach that confession, get your congregation to think in terms of adopting a confession that will nail your colors to the mast and say, this is what we believe. We're pre-committed. We're unashamed. We affirm this. We will defend this because we believe this is the clear teaching of God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us your word and we thank you for those who have understood it and helped us to understand it. And we want to be good stewards of what you've revealed to us. And I thank you for the wonderful confessions of faith that have been uh, penned throughout history. And we ask that you would help us in our day when there's, it's a minority opinion to think like this. Lord, help us to weigh out these issues and to resolve to live unashamedly, boldly, declaring what your word teaches. And to do so with a view to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus. For we pray in his name. Amen.